As history progresses and we learn of our respective pasts, a theme begins to present itself. Those in power would like to display this theme as something that they had developed. They would like you to believe that it is as a result of their decisions that things came to be. They would like you to believe that they were the architects of change. That they were the decision makers which led to you having the freedoms you hold. They would like you to believe that they gave you the freedom to do what you want to do, when you want to do it and how you want to do it. The reality is, throughout history, as the masses of people are forced through the norms of time by those in charge, from time to time one of us rises. They'll stand up, look around, breathe the air and see something better on the horizon. Then, with an almighty burst of fear and courage, they will run at the wall. When the wall comes down, like sheep, we will all see the gap and follow them through with ease. Let us not forget, the first of us through the wall always gets bloody. What does it take to become one of these people? It's the life of an Irish woman which answers these questions for us. This is her story. In 1889, under the hot sun of Sydney, Australia, a child was born. Her name was Sarah Dirac. Sarah's parents were the survivors of the Great Famine in Ireland. As children, they struggled to cling to life on the harsh coast of Clare. As tenant farmers, their days were numbered before the famine ever cloaked the land with horror. Battered by the sea and starved by the land, they made the decision to leave home in the hope that one day the sun may rise for them again. Sarah's father, Thomas, worked hard when he first landed in Van Diemen's land and after some time raised enough funds to run a pub in Sydney. Her mother, Mary, spent her youth in the wild Atlantic waters of Clare and found the water liberated her soul from the hardship of her youth. She wanted her children to appreciate the water's abilities to momentarily wash pain and suffering away, and so she took Sarah to Coogee Bats to learn how to swim. Here, Amy became friends with a girl called Mina. Mina was the daughter of the owner of the bats facility. The two became close over time as they learned how to swim. As they progressed, they became fiercely competitive with one another. Outside of the water, they were the best of friends. In the water, they were just each other's competition. As they improved, they learned that women were only allowed to compete in the breaststroke competition, as according to the sporting authorities, women were not capable of safely swimming any other way. Sarah quickly perfected and excelled in this style of swimming. Her coaches quickly recognised her abilities and began entering her into competitions. In 1906, at the age of 17, she won her first major title. The race itself was largely uneventful, primarily as as soon as the race had begun, it was clear to the other swimmers that they were not in the same league as Sarah. As she touched the wall to end the race, the other swimmers were still due to complete their final turns. When she received her medal, she felt an immense pride in herself. 
She saw too the pride in her family's eyes and understood the struggles that they had endured for her to enjoy the life where she was capable of having hobbies and activities rather than a daily struggle. It was from this moment that Sarah decided to dedicate all her time to achieving so that her parents would always see that their sacrifices were worth it. Sarah began to believe that she had an equal, if not better, swimming abilities to the men that she had seen in competitions. She wanted to prove this, but had a major issue. The world of men was not yet ready to believe in the abilities of women. Whilst the men wore swimsuits to help them go faster, Sarah and the other women were very much restricted in their attire. Modesty was a real concern for the men over women. The women were forced to swim in heavy clothing to cover as much of them as possible and as not to offend the men. Big heavy cotton and wool swimming togs were used which when became wet became incredibly heavy. Sarah caused outroar when at a race she turned up in a one piece made out of the same material as the men's togs. The sporting authorities were outraged, but she had read their rule book and found it only described how much of the woman should be covered and not what she should be covered in. Not only was their attire an issue, but partaking in sports was also frowned upon. A leading doctor at Women's Health at the time stated, Playing sport not only puts your modesty at stake, but violent movements of the body can cause a loosening of the uterus resulting in sterility, defeating the woman's true purpose in life, the bringing forth of strong children. Sarah had little concern with the thoughts of men on her abilities. At this point, she was already the owner of most of Australia's swimming records, 56 medals and over 100 trophies. Having reached the very top of swimming in Australia, she needed a new and better challenge. She set her eyes on world titles. At the time, only men competed in international events, and there was no events where women could compete with other women of similar capabilities internationally. The Olympics at the time were not as open to all as they are today, with their beliefs that the Olympics are about the exertion of male athleticism and female applause as its reward. That was until 1910, as the suffragette movement began to grow. The Olympic Committee, for the first time, voted to allow women swimming in the 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm. Upon hearing the news, Sarah didn't smile or celebrate. She got a gear bag ready went to the pool and prepared. She was going to go where no woman had gone before and was going to show the world what women could do. As she trained, she heard that Australia would not be sending a women's team to the Olympics as it wouldn't be right and proper for a woman to compete internationally. It would be a bad image for Australia. There are also strong suggestions that they specifically did not want Sarah to go as she refused to wear their uniform for women and did not want to be embarrassed by her. A campaign began by Sarah's fans, mostly women, to put pressure on the Australian Olympic Committee to let her go. After a series of protests, they eventually backed down on the grounds that should any woman wish to compete in the Olympics, she would have to pay her own way. The men would require the committee's funding.
the Irish women of Australia rose to the call. As they learnt of the suffragette movement at home, they too learnt of the Irish woman seeking to let the world see what the daughters of Ireland were capable of. Those who'd begun to make a fortune in Australia rallied together and sent Sarah to Stockholm. When she arrived at the Olympics, she found the male world of sport was not the most welcoming for women. When the time came to swim in her first heat, she found the officials disinterested and distracted as they set up the race. She took this personally, and to prove a point in the first ever heat of the women's swimming in the Olympic Games, not only did Sarah destroy her competition, she set a world record in the act, across all genders. The world stood up and took notice. When she got out of the pool, she did not celebrate or pause for applause. Focused like a sniper, her eyes were on a bigger prize. Women across the world began to hear of this incredible female athlete at the Olympics and clambered to get any news of her. The women back in Ireland began to see this great inspiration from their sister in the struggle and it motivated them more and more to join the suffragette cause. In fact, as Sarah entered the arena for the Olympics final, a trial was taking place back in Ireland of four women who had smashed windows in Dublin in a struggle for women's rights. In the Olympic final, Sarah again dispatched her competition easily and came home with the gold. Embarrassingly, for the Australian Sporting Committee, who tried to stop her going to the event, it was their only gold for the Olympics that year. She broke her own and world records in the final. Sarah returned to Australia as a national icon. She was the woman who rose. When asked about her feelings towards the Swimming Association of Australia, Sarah responded. I only have one question of them. Is the Ladies Swimming Association formed for swimming or for what its president defines as modesty? Maybe that he's changed their name to the Women's Modesty Association. Over the next six years, Sarah broke 12 international swimming records, men's and women's. She was invited on a tour of America and Europe in order to show the young girls of the world what women could do if they ignored the limits set by men. Not willing to ever avoid a fight for women, in 1918 and in 1919, she was suspended for refusing to swim unless her coach's expenses were covered, as the men's coaches had been doing. She was then suspended for partaking in an American tour with her male teammates without the approval of the Swimming Association. In 1920, the world gathered eagerly as the Australian swimming team were due to go to Antwerp for the Olympics. Unfortunately, in the lead up to the event, Sarah's appendix burst. She had also only just recovered from typhoid fever and pneumonia. These events forced her to withdraw reluctantly from the Olympics. Failing to recover properly from various afflictions, in 1921, Sarah was forced to retire from swimming after achieving all there was to achieve. Shortly after her retirement, she married a horse trainer called Bernard Martin. She spent the rest of her life teaching children how to swim and coaching elite athletes. In 1956, Sarah's life was cut short by cancer.
The music for this episode was written, performed and produced by Ryan O'Halloran. The story was researched and scripted by myself, Oren. If you'd like to help support this podcast, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash we the Irish or leave us a review on your podcast app. Oren is Anam Dunn. Gurv Magut, Slán Anish.